the best job in the world. I'm a doctor. No, believe me, that's not why. I'm an obesity doctor. I have the honor of working with a group of people subject to the last widely accepted prejudice, being fat. These people have suffered a lot by the time they see me. Shame, guilt, blame, and outright discrimination. The attitude that many take, including those in healthcare, is that these people are to blame for their situation. If they could just control themselves, they wouldn't be overweight, and they're not motivated to change. Please let me tell you, this is not the case. The blame, if we've got to extend some here, has been with our advice, and it's time we change that. Obesity is a disease. It's not something created by lack of character. It's a hormonal disease, and there are many hormones involved, and one of the main ones is a hormone called insulin. Most obese individuals are resistant to this hormone, insulin. So what does that mean exactly, to be resistant to insulin? Well, insulin resistance is essentially a state of pre-pre type 2 diabetes. Insulin's job is to drive glucose or blood sugar into the cells where it can be used. In a nutshell, when someone is insulin resistant, they are having trouble getting blood sugar where it needs to go into those cells. And it just can't hang out in the blood after we eat, or we would all have a diabetic crisis after every meal. So when someone is resistant to insulin, the body's response to this is to just make more of it. And insulin levels will rise and rise, and for a while, years even, this is going to keep up, and blood sugar levels can remain normal. However, usually it can't keep up forever, and even at those elevated levels of insulin are not enough to keep blood sugar in the normal range. So it starts to rise. That's diabetes. It probably won't surprise you to hear that most of my patients have insulin resistance or diabetes. And if you're sitting there thinking, Phew, that's not me, you actually might want to think again, because almost 50% of adult Americans now have diabetes or prediabetes. That is almost 120 million of us. But that's hardly everyone who has issues with insulin. Because as I was saying, people have elevated insulin levels due to insulin resistance for years, even decades before the diagnosis of even prediabetes is made. The trouble with insulin resistance is, if it goes up, we are at great risk for developing type 2 diabetes. But also, insulin makes us hungry. And the food we eat, much more likely to be stored as fat. Insulin is our fat storage hormone. So we can start to see how it's going to be a problem for diseases like obesity and metabolic issues like diabetes. But what if we trace this problem back to the beginning and we just didn't have so much glucose around that insulin needed to deal with? Let's take a look at how that could be. Everything you eat is either a carbohydrate, a protein, or a fat. And they all have a very different effect on glucose and therefore insulin levels, as you can see on the graph. So when we eat carbohydrates, our insulin and glucose are going to spike up fast. And with proteins, it looks a lot better. But take a look at what happens when we eat fat. Essentially nothing, a flat line. And this is going to wind up being very important. So now I want to translate that graph for you into a real-world situation. I want you to go back and think about the last time you ate an American version of Chinese food. We all know there's rules associated with this, right? And the first rule is you're going to overeat because the stop signal doesn't get sent until you are literally busting at the seams. Rule number two is in an hour, you're starving. Why? Well, because the rice in that meal caused glucose and insulin to skyrocket, which triggered hunger, fat storage, and cravings. So, if you're insulin resistant to begin with, and your insulin levels are already higher, you really are hungrier all the time. And we have this set up. Eat carbs, your glucose goes up, your insulin goes up, and you have hunger and fat storage.
when our patients decrease their carbs, their glucose goes down and they don't need as much insulin. So those insulin levels drop and fast. And this is very important because a study looking at our National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data, better known as NHANES, showed that the single biggest risk factor for coronary artery disease is insulin resistance. It is responsible for a whopping 42% of heart attacks. Low carb intervention works so fast that we can literally pull people off of hundreds of units of insulin in days to weeks. Low carb intervention works so fast that we can literally pull people off of hundreds of units of insulin in days to weeks. If we take the carbs out, what are we gonna put in? Because remember, there's only three macronutrients. If one goes down, one has to go up. My patients eat fat and a lot of it. What, you say? I mean, what's going to happen when you eat fat? Well, let me tell you, you're going to be happy because fat tastes great and it is incredibly satisfying. <laughs> but remember, fat is the only macronutrient that's going to keep our glucose, blood sugar, and insulin levels low, and that is so important. So I want you to now hear my simple rules for eating. These rules, you have to remember, are even going to be more important if you are one of the tens of millions of Americans who have trouble with insulin levels. Rule number one, if it says light, low fat, or fat free, stays in the grocery store. Because if they took the fat out, they put carbs and chemicals in. Rule number two, eat food. The most important rule in low carb nutrition. Real food does not come in a box, and no one should have to tell you real food is natural. You should know that when you look at it. Don't eat anything you don't like. And eat when you're hungry, don't eat when you're not, no matter what the clock says. And number five is a simple way to remember what we want to avoid. No GPS. No grains, no potatoes, and no sugar. That last one is a biggie, right? No grains? Yeah, no grains. But we have to have them. Nope, they're a carb. But whole grains are so good for us. Well, First of all, there are actually very few foods out there that are truly whole grain, even when they say they are. Most foods that purport themselves to be whole grain are highly processed and the fiber benefit ruined, or they're coming with highly refined flour. I want to show you a couple pictures of my radical food. So this is a common breakfast in my house. So does it look like I just broke my own rule? I didn't, because this muffin is made with coconut flour. I bake all the time still. I just use non-grain-based flours. Coconut, almond, hazelnut, flax, they make delicious things. And this is a typical dinner in my house with a typical starch. That would be the sautéed mushrooms. Now, my patients and I eat delightful food all of the time and enjoy it. But what about the research on this? I mean, is this just anecdotal evidence now from my clinic? No. There are dozens of randomized control trials looking at low-carb intervention for things like diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors, obesity. They're consistent. It works. There are even a large numbers, uh, number of studies showing that low-carb nutrition decreases inflammatory markers, which is making it really exciting for diseases like cancer.